Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Carol, as well, for the introduction, and for TDC and for Amazon for bringing us uh, together this evening. Um, when I uh, first uh, got the invitation, I, of course, I'm very honored to, uh, to be opening the, the conference. Um, the second thought I, has, I had was like, fuck it, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not the kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, there's certain kinds of presentations that come with a little bit more pressure. This is one of them. And I've been stressing about this for like three months now. So, um, but hopefully it will be okay. Uh, I was told that this presentation can be a little bit more personal in nature. So I decided to, uh, I'm not gonna show you my vacation pictures. So just in case you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this talk is a little bit different than a one that I would give if it was part of the regular TypeCon program. I've, I've spoken at TypeCon before and other conferences, but this one is a little bit different. And um, I, I will start with uh, disclaimers. <laughs> uh, I will be talking about politics and design today uh, as part of the talk. Uh, any views, that's a disclaimer, any views that I share with you today, my political views represent myself and not the company monotype where I work. We are not uh, as a company engaged in politics, but of course, as individual people we have. And because this is a personal talk for me, I really wish that we do talk about politics today. Um, also, when it comes to design, I also will be sharing some of my um, uh, perspectives on, on design today. And this is, again, not representative of the monotype view of design, this is Nadine at Monotype. So we are four type directors for Monotype. I'm just one of them. We have different views and we are encouraged to be different. So we're not, you know, we have the freedom of looking at typefaces in different ways and that's totally okay. So disclaimers out of the way. Ah, one more also. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I know that maybe some of the things I will say might be a little bit insulting to people. I will try to do so as graciously as possible uh, and, and, and as respectfully <laughs> as I can. Uh, because I am discussing politics at the beginning, roughly half the people might not like what I'm going to say. Depends how much of a blue or a red state this is. Uh, <laughs> let's see, we, we will hear, I think, the laughter we can tell. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, one of the reasons why um, I wanted to uh, talk about politics is, is because my, the one belief that I do have when it comes to design is that the typefaces that we design cannot be separated from the reality they live in. Uh, we, we simply cannot do that. Typefaces are ingredients. They come to life when they are used, and they are used in the reality and environment we live in. And there is this continuous dialogue between the typefaces and uh, what they are trying to say. There is no disconnection between those. So uh, it is important then that we discuss the reality, which we will do now, a little part of it, not all of it, obviously, otherwise we sit here forever. Uh, and then we get to talk about the typefaces. So there will be design later, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope you can um, bear with me. So I, I also have 147 slides for today, so uh, brace yourselves. It's gonna be long. <laughs> so um, yeah, I came across, um, Actually, before I get into this, another reason why it is also important to talk about politics and design together, um, I don't know if you've heard about the fuss or the hype or the controversy around Apple changing the uh, emoji for the gun. Yes? So, yeah? By show of yeah, so, so basically, okay, so some, so they changed their, uh, the emoji of a gun into a toy gun. And that is a political statement that came through design. This is not the isolated instance where design and politics have merged together. And I do believe that design has a very strong role in shaping the conversation of today. And I do believe that we as designers can do a lot more than what we currently do. So it's not just myself who is being interested in politics. It's even up as big as Apple. And um, yeah, so let's just get into it. So, so this article that, um, uh, I came across, it's called Making Sense of One Particular Reality, and, and the, uh, the reality is why Trump is so popular. So yes, we're gonna talk about Trump, <laughs> as if he hasn't been covered enough in the media. But anyway, so, uh, so it's a very interesting uh, article because it talks about um, 
a neuroscience. So we're not saying this is left or right or whatever it is. We're not discussing policy or lack of expertise or whatever it is. We're just, or the neuroscientist who wrote this is simply trying to understand uh, why is it that he has such uh, massive support. So, um, uh, one of the things he talks about, and, and I do recommend just Google or his name and the article and then you'll, you'll see. Um, he talks about people who lack the expertise in an area of knowledge often have a cognitive bias that prevents them from realizing that they lack expertise. In simpler terms, they're not smart enough to know they're dumb. So I, I'm quoting him. I'm not saying this. I'm quoting him. <laughs> so, um, so basically, uh, the, the, the problem uh, is that these people are not aware that they are misinformed. And if you bring an expert and they try talking to this person, this person is like, I don't need this opinion. I already know the truth. I don't need more. And, and this is why uh, the people who try to engage with Trump supporters, when they bring experts to say, no, he's, you know, this is not true, or you can't actually build a wall, or whatever it is, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so, so this is then a small demographic that exists in every society. Uh, this, always some of those. And, and, and so this is, uh, this is also interesting. Uh, when there was the Brexit, do you guys know about Brexit? Yes? Okay. When <laughs> there was one of the uh, leading people in the vote for yes for Brexit, he, he was on interview and somebody was saying, like, yes, but experts are saying that this is going to be terrible. And he told them, and I think with a, a phrase that sums up the reality today, um, people are tired of experts. And, and that, is, that is a very sad thing, but it is also true in some cases that um, people have come to expect that it's not important to have experts. Uh, it's a bit scary as us, as experts in our field, but it's also a bit of, uh, it's, uh, it's a sad reality for all of us that uh, this lack of trust in institutions and in, in experts is, is coming about. So. Um, so this is uh, an important thing. Another thing uh, he talks about in the, uh, in the, in the article, um, which is, was a study, and they had conservatives and they had liberals, and uh, they were um, you know, uh, shown startling noises and graphic images, and the conservatives showed more a uh, stronger physiological reaction, uh, which is quite interesting, because you wouldn't expect that. But for some reason, uh, that was the case. If we uh, think, uh, again, what they are saying is that this reaction is automatic and reacts very strongly to fear, uh, then again, if we remember, um, uh, for example, what John McCain was saying, that he's fired up the crazies, uh, then you, <laughs> I'm quoting again, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> so, so, so this is, um, y you have these people who are uh, you know, reacting more strongly to fear and, uh, and sometimes so fearful that they are coming across as being crazy. And this is, uh, again, an unfortunate situation. But um, uh, he goes on to add to that. Uh, why is it that these kinds of people are becoming noisy now? Why didn't we have them before? Uh, and, and he says that this is coming from a terror management theory that when people are reminded of their own mortality, which happens with fear monitoring, then they will be more strongly, they will more strongly defend those who share their worldviews and national or ethnic identity, and that they will act out more aggressively towards those who don't. So when you tell people that this other group is coming to kill you and rape you, you bring out fear in that person, and they will become more racist just by the nature of it. And in reality, there is a racist in all of us. We all have the possibility to be good people and bad people. It's just you choose to try to be a better version of yourself. And you try to not give in to being afraid of people who are not like you. If you have a group of people, random, bring them at the beginning of the day, and this is another study, just half of them give them the blue t-shirt, the other half the red t-shirt. By the end of the day, they're divided because you divided them, because it's natural instinct for humans to want to bond with people who are like them, because we need to be with people who are like us, because we need to build communities. And, and, and this is the reality. So we need to move or be able to move beyond that. And it takes more effort to be accepting of people who do not look like you or do not talk like you or do not live like you. And, um, and, and so, yeah, when we are afraid, we are more regressing back to those instances. But then the question is, why are we so afraid today? And if you look at the statistics of how many people actually dying in the US these days from terrorist attacks, it's like not as high 
as you would think it is, given the media. Uh, if you look at the coverage of Fox News, for example, for the last seven years, and the kind of vitriol that has been blasted on the airwaves. Uh, in the 100 days, first 100 days of uh, President Obama's uh, term, uh, they had like this montage with the Carmina Burana song, like, pum, 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 you know, with like the collage and everything, and uh, showing pictures of bombs and scary, really scary stuff. And you're looking like, what, really? Should we escape now? <laughs> and, 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 and there is always this, um, He's going to come for your guns, and then there's going to be the death squad killing your grandmas. He will, he's, at some point, he's Hitler. At some point, he's Muslim. At some point, he's not even American. There's never been this much disrespect of the presidency in any presidency before. It's shameful. But it's also creating a climate of fear of the president himself, plus the people who are actual enemies of this country. So it's a very scary thing because if you cannot trust your own government and you cannot and you're scared of your enemies, like what the fuck do you do? So it's really it's it's no wonder people are scared. And if they are scared, they, yeah, of course they will become more nationalist. It's not a good thing, but but this is what's happening. And so there is this climate of fear. And and the problem is uh, that uh, for many years. Uh, every time they want, or many people on the right want to criticize the president, it would be like, yeah, he's a Nazi, he's Hitler. And the, 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 the ludicrousy of the argument is often that, you know what, Obama likes to have breakfast. You know who else likes breakfast? Hitler. That's, that, that's, that's how it is sometimes, and, and <laughs> it's a little bit scary. So the, the, the problem is that when you get to a point where you have someone who is running for president, actually using Nazi propaganda, actually showing fascist tendencies, you can't use the argument that he's actually sounding like a Nazi because it's been used so many times before that, yeah, he's, it, it's the boy who cried wolf. It's been the scary thing. Every time you want to disagree with someone, you call them a Nazi, that when you finally get someone who actually retweets racist and uh, uh, xenophobic and all sorts of vile things on Twitter, you can't actually say he's a Nazi anymore because it just sounds like what everybody else has been saying about Obama already. It's, it's the N word is, or the Nazi word is no longer effective, uh, which is again a lot of too much uh, hyped up fear and now you get to a point where yeah, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. And I'm not the first one who said this. There's a very good interview with Jon Stewart about uh, why Trump is there, and, and he speaks much better than I do. So I, I would recommend that you maybe listen to that as well. Um, but, but the crazy thing is, the other scary thing is, is the political discourse itself, because Trump is not uh, an isolated incident. He, it started with Palin, and then there was the election cycle of last time, where basically there was one crazy guy after the other, and then they couldn't agree, and then you got Romney, and then they didn't go anywhere, and this time they just wanted the crazier and crazier. And, um, and there is this word that Stephen Colbert talks about, it's called the truthiness, which is not the truth, it's just something that sounds like the truth. And there was this interview with Newt Gingrich the other day, and he was like, there is more you know, uh, death and, and you know, uh, more uh, crime in the US, and things are going worse. And the interviewer from CNN, she was like, but no, like, if you look at the facts, the numbers, they're down in the US. And he was like, no, no, how come about Chicago? And she's like, yeah, an exception, but the rest of the US is coming down. And, and he's saying, like, no, no, but that's a fact. People are afraid, and that's a fact. She was like, yes, but, but the fact is like the numbers are down. But, and he was like, no, it feels like that. And we got to a point now where if something feels to be true, then it is true. And, and that, I think, is the scariest thing of all. It's not Trump or Fox News or whoever it is who is running. It's the fact that we've come to a point where people don't, no longer can distinguish between what is true, what is fact, and what is a feeling. And feelings can be very easily manipulated. And then when you have someone with a very good entertainment history and can actually put on a good show, then you get what we have now. And, and that's, um, that's the scary part. So, um, and the, the problem also, when we have these kinds of elections, is that uh, we listen to people speaking and, and we're hearing all of these messages, but we forget, and then four years later we hear them again, but in the meantime, is anyone paying attention to the voting records, what these people are actually doing? Um, and it is shocking sometimes, uh, the, what people say on the trail, on the campaign trail, and what actually gets to be voted upon. Uh, one of the disgraces that I've 
like the most shocking thing that I just cannot believe uh, from a party which says that it is the most patriotic, which is supposedly the Republicans. And um, they continually would not support the uh, health bill for the first responders on 9-11. And, and I'm not even American and I am insulted. Like these people ran into buildings and um, they're getting cancer, they're getting all sorts of diseases because of that action, because of their heroic action. And they can't even pay for uh, their health treatment. This is a disgrace. And so it is more important that we look at the voting records, what people actually do uh, when they get elected, rather than simply the promises of what they want to do should they get elected. And, and, and this is why it comes back to us here. What, what can we do as people? Uh, we, we need to be taking ownership of the consequences of our voting, of our communication with people, of, of our bringing out the vote, all of it. Uh, we, we're not spectators in this. We live this reality and we need to be able to engage with it. Um, so I hope you bear with me. So for people who <laughs> want or were supporting Bernie, uh, I can feel your pain <laughs> and, and, and feel the burn as well. But, uh, but the reality is he didn't get the nomination for one reason or another. And, and, and many people don't want to vote for Hillary, but, um, and I can also understand that as well. But the reality is we, 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 we vote for a program. It's not just the person. And it's, just, it's not just the personality of the person or who makes better TV or, uh, you know, we need to be able to put aside uh, our differences and, and, and to look for a program. And, and so hopefully <laughs> you, you are on board of that program. And, and rather than simply taking a stand and letting, letting the other side get to the nuclear codes. <laughs> for people who want Hillary, uh, well, you've been waiting for it, right? So go, <laughs> get the vote out. Don't just vote, get your friends to vote and see what you want to do on election day. Drive someone if they don't have a car, babysit for your neighbor so that they can go vote. Or people who are unable to register, help them register. This is important. Getting the vote out is more important than simply the one vote that we cast. Um, for the conservatives who do not want to support, who are not currently supporting Trump, um, there's a lot of you I know, <laughs> and, and your leadership is also in the same position. And I cannot tell people what to vote or not to vote, but if it were me, I would, I would keep my honor <laughs> and not vote for this person. It's just uh, you, you need your party back, and he has derailed it, and if it continues like this, it falls off the cliff. Um, it's been pushed so much to the right, it's no longer itself. Ronald Reagan cannot be elected at the same age. He's not crazy. And, and that's not what you want. That's not what the party stood for. And, and so this is important. And for those who do want to vote for Trump, um, you don't hear experts, so I, and I don't know what I can say, but maybe you could go on vacation in November and maybe to Mexico. <laughs> and maybe you discover they're not all rapists. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and and why, why am I saying this today? Uh, the crazy is always louder than the sane, and I do hope that we all belong to the sane. Uh, people who are more extreme are louder, and they get to dominate the news cycle, they get to make the headlines, and the people who are normal, normal everyday people, they're not loud enough because they're just regular, they're not screaming their heads off, but this is the majority, the silent majority, and it needs to find its voice, and, and, and we need to be able to find the path. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, at least this is how I see it. And, and why engage in this discussion at all at a design conference as well? I'm sorry I put you through this. Um, I hope some of it was interesting. <laughs> but, but the reality is politics is everything. Uh, politics is a mother who cannot, uh, you know, get back to work because there isn't good childcare or uh, someone who needs to do three jobs because minimum wage is so little or the pollution or w global warming or whatever it is, we, we're living it. Politics is not something that happens in Washington. It's not something that happens only in parliament in London or in some whatever um, uh, capital that it is. We, we live this and we, we live also in a time where politics has been stigmatized as something that is too divisive and something that we should not engage in. But at the end of the day, we cannot leave the choices of the things that we care about to people who only care about being elected. If we forget about these choices and only show up to vote once every four years, we've given them free reign 
to basically suck up to their lobbyists and the people who fund their campaigns. And I think that's something that uh, uh, puts us all into trouble. So uh, this is uh, my last slide <laughs> when it comes to politics. It's from the national convention, uh, the Democrat National Convention. So President Obama was speaking and uh, he mentioned Trump and people started booing and, and he said, just don't boo, just vote. And, and so for fuck's sakes, please vote. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so that's it for the political section. So I hope that wasn't too, was it painful? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now we get to talk about design, thank God. Um, yeah, like I, I've been very stressed about this section because um, we're here for design, we're not here for politics, but uh, you know, should Trump get elected and things go as catastrophic as we all fear, I would like to think at least that I tried something. And, and to have people here who can actually vote, I don't, I don't vote, I don't count here. So no matter how much I scream, even if I wanted to go crazy and scream, nobody doesn't do, do anything. So I, this is my contribution to trying to bring a slightly different change in this course. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, ah, okay. So next part gets even worse. So. Um, the, the title of the talk today is Why We Design, and, and I thought that maybe I started with why I design, and then maybe you guys can think why you design. And, and I do want a long Q&A session, and um, I, the talk is structured in a way, there's always a headline and then in ACO, and then the text in, um, in the other typeface, and uh, yeah, completely forgot, mind black completely. Anyway, so the text in bold, this is a question, that we should be asking ourselves. And what is underneath, this is my answer. And you all will have different answers, and that's totally how it should be. Uh, every person is governed by a unique set of experiences. And uh, we all have different answers. But the important thing is not the answer, it's the fact that we ask these questions and that we engage in a conversation. That's why there will be a Q&A session, so get your answers or questions ready. And, and so any, any one of these questions, should you just feel like showing up like in the Q&A and to just say your answer is more than welcome. This is what we're supposed to be doing. So, uh, so why I design? I, I was born in 1978. That's why I'm getting old comment. Um, so I was born in Beirut. I'm Lebanese. And, and um, this was in the middle of the Lebanese civil war, so 1975 to 1990. Uh, the country was practically destroyed. Uh, similar in a smaller scale to what you see now in Syria. And um, so, uh, and just a few years after that, I started university in 1996. I studied graphic design. And um, on the heels of the country that is destroyed, and, and uh, uh, that's my childhood, basically, that's how I grew up. Uh, I started this graphic design program. We took typography classes, and I was faced with the shocking and hard reality of being unable to design anything in Arabic because of the poor quality of typography. We had extremely poor typefaces, extremely unexpressive, horrible, like really, uh, you cannot imagine, <laughs> beyond what you can imagine. And uh, on the other hand, uh, there was this gorgeous calligraphy. I, I was very lucky to have a most wonderful teacher. This is Samir Sayer. He used to teach Arabic typography at the American University of Beirut. Um, he taught me Arabic typography. He's been my mentor since then. Every time I go home, I go see him and uh, look at his work. This is the one tableau that he's decided here on this side. And um, he, um, he opened my eyes and so many other designers as well to the beauty of Arabic calligraphy and to the potential of Arabic calligraphy to change, to evolve, because Arabic calligraphy got to its classical golden age, like around 200 years ago, and since then it's been stuck in the same place, and he feels that there is more that we can do, and when it comes to typography, there is for sure more that we can do. And so he instilled in myself and in many others, and this is why there's so many Lebanese type designers uh, designing Arabic typefaces, he sort of instilled in us the wish to do better, and also a solid understanding that, that, that we come with a very strong legacy in calligraphy, and that typography does not have to look the way it does. So um, uh, one of the things that caught my eye in that course was uh, the early, early Kufi. This is what you see over here. Um, this style had sort of disappeared. Uh, you do not see this in day-to-day -day life. Arabic calligraphy that I knew before I studied with him 
did not look like this. The visual was not like this. It's more organic, softer, more round. Uh, but I was very interested in this because it had a sense of modernity in it, a powerful, bold, strong, and, and clean kind of look that I found to be very inspiring. And it was the first time that I could look at Arabic calligraphy and think that we can be modern, we can be contemporary in Arabic, that it is possible because it's happened before, it's there. And uh, it was almost a revelation that, that we can have this kind of modernity come in into Arabic typography. And, and that was enchanting because if you are only faced with very classical designs and then you want to express something which is not necessarily classical, then you don't have the words you want to say. And if you do not have the right typefaces, you do not have the right expression. And if you don't have the right expression, you do not have the right voice. And if you cannot speak as an Arab about having a modernity, about being contemporary, about belonging to this century, not to 200 years ago or 500 years ago, that you belong now, that the future is yours, then you do not have hope that you can be contemporary. Then you are only living in a tent, riding a camel and living in the desert. If we only keep that classical style, that's, that's how it is. It's, that's how it felt. And, and so I wanted that we try to find something that feels like it belongs to today. And, and I've been looking for, for that since then. So um, there is a, it's, it's not that I saw interesting shapes and I was like, oh, I'd like to draw these. It's, it's a bit different from that. Um, this is uh, one of my typefaces. This was made as a, like an installation at the um, Victoria State Library in Melbourne, and, and it says Hiya al-Hayat, which means uh, this is life, and uh, or it is life, and that the typeface cannot be divorced from the environment it lives in, which is the same as I was saying before. And, and uh, again, there is that correlation between what the design is saying and what the actual text is saying and where it can be used and what it will say. And this is Kulluha uh, Hub, which is full of love, uh, which is hopefully what we want life to be like. <laughs> so, uh, so this is sort of how I got into designing. And, and I've often been asked, like, ah, oh, but don't you want to design something else than Arabic, like maybe Greek or Indic or like another exotic script? And I always am looking at people like, seriously? Like, why? And because for me, it's, it's not about collecting. It's not Pokemon Go. I'm not collecting Pokemons, right? <laughs> It's, 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 not, it's not like, ah, I can do Arabic and Indic and Chinese and Japanese. Look at me, I can do great things. No, it's, it's not that. I, I want better Arabic typefaces so that Arabic communication in the Middle East looks better. I, I don't care what happens in other countries. I, I, I care about my country. I'm like, fuck it, no? It's, it's just, sorry, too many F words today. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so for me, it's, it's, not, it's not design for the sake of design. It's, uh, it's, it's more about uh, what you want the typeface to do. And, and in my case, it's, it's about dialogue. It's about using typefaces to speak and to say things. And, and this, is, this is coming from, uh, from this person. This is the late Edward Said. He uh, taught at Columbia University. He was a Palestinian humanist. And he spoke at my graduation from the AUB in Beirut in the year 2000. And, and I'm going to be reading to you some of what he said because it's still the most important speech I've heard in my entire life. And I don't think anything, any single event had ever influenced me as much as this guy. And, and, and what he had said that we, we come today at that ceremony to talk not about the clash of civilizations, but rather than the dialogue of civilizations that is a peaceful but critical dialogue between equals rather than a belligerent screaming match that when we accept the differences, that we are different, that we can talk to each other, it's OK to be different. We don't have to fight. We just need to be able to talk. And I think this translates. He's talking about politics. I see that in politics, in design, and in everything that we can do. It's too often that we look at the other, the one who is different from us, and we retreat into our shell, and we reject them. But we need to be able to coexist. And, and, and so it's not about the clash. It's about the dialogue. And if we all need more dialogue, um, in, in, in this age. And this was the year 2000. This was before September 11. This was before ISIS. This was before all of the terrorist attacks happening in Europe. It's, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And I do feel that 
the solution is never more bombing and more drones. The solution is that we try to understand each other and take out the root of the problem, not the symptom of it. And so he talks about, um, and he says that what we need to ask is who am I and what is my relationship to my background and tradition and what is my relationship to other? We need to be able to answer these questions. And then these are questions not only to be asked by philosophers or political scientists, but are the responsibility of every citizen, no matter what profession or expertise he or she possesses. That we cannot hide inside the profession and say, I am a doctor or an engineer, and all I want to do is to get on with my work. We all hide. We all say, no, I'm only a designer, and you know, maybe I vote, and that will be the end of it. But we cannot, we cannot escape that. We, we, cannot, we are citizens first, before we are anything else. And, and so, so this has influenced my work because most of the work that I've done, almost the majority of it, has been about the relationship of Arabic and Latin and coexistence and harmony and dialogue between the different scripts so that you can put them on the same page and not have a clash, but actually two scripts that can come together in harmony. And um, the uh, first example of that was my kufiya which I designed at Reading. It was the first typeface with Latin and Arabic designed by the same person at the same time with the specific intent of, of harmony between the two. And uh, again, very heavily influenced by what Edward Said had said, uh, because we need to accept that Arabic is different from Latin, that structures are different, movement is different, but we need to be able to find ways to get them to talk to one another, and, and, and we can do that. Uh, if we think of like type design today and non-Latin and all of that, there are possibilities of how to combine and make multi-script families that are in harmony. It's quite possible, and it's been done, and it is actually very trendy these days, but back in 2003, it wasn't the case. It was very, very early. On. And, and, and this is what I had tried, that uh, we can actually have a brochure with Arabic and English and not have them fighting at each other. And normally, when you do that, when you have Arabic and English or Arabic and French together, the English or the French, they look so much better than the Arabic because the Arabic is always a crappy font that you don't want to look at and you try to use as small as possible so that people don't notice how badly drawn it is. But then it's a, it's, it says something about you if your typefaces are so poorly drawn. It's almost like you don't deserve better than that. And that is what is so insulting about having such poor Arabic typography, that it's almost we don't deserve better, that we are not better. And, and, and you, you know, it's difficult for you guys because you guys have the better type than we do. So you don't, it's, it's difficult to explain to people whose typography is amazing just how uh, horrible it is to not have decent typefaces <laughs> to set your own language. Um, but but it, is, it is the case. And, and so this is what I was trying to do with Kofia. So, uh, and uh, yeah, it's also my, the only Latin I've ever designed. So even though today I supervise Latin design, I still don't design Latin because there are many people who do a better job than me. So I'm not gonna waste my time. So you have to be efficient, right? So uh, you have to accept that, uh, you know, there are more skilled people <laughs> when it comes to Latin. So, uh, and sometimes Arabic, I'm not saying I'm the best. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like, that's a good headline, yes. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so, so that was what I, what I did at, um, at Reading. And, and straight after Reading, I was, I was offered um, uh, a, a training and a, and a job at Linotype. And uh, I, uh, I, when I got the offer, I, I was actually in Vancouver, so not very far. It was at A-Type I. And I asked uh, Jean-Francois Porchez, like, what do you think? They're offering me something. And he was like, he, he's the one who said this. There are two gods in typography, Hermann Zapf and Adrian Frutiger. They both work with Linotype. And Hermann Zapf comes twice to the office. And I was like, yes, OK. So yes, that, that sums up, basically. So um, th the reason why I mentioned this is um, now we're going to be talking a little bit. We're going to be changing topics, by the way, quite a lot. So I, I hope that's not too weird for you. But uh, when I joined Linotype, I, at the first conference that I went to after that, it was a type I in Helsinki, and, and it was a little bit weird. Um, some people in the, in the industry thought it was a weird thing. It's almost like I gave up something by going to Linotype, like that this is not the right decision, that I should have been an independent designer with my own foundry and, and do it my own way and, and you know, go the way. But, uh, but it, was, it was a good thing for me that I went to Linotype. They, um, hired a lawyer to keep me. They hired, applied for my visa twice, supported me. I learned a lot. 
uh, I, I got to work with many amazing people and, and uh, the most wonderful opportunities. And, and uh, one of them ah, being able to work with Adrian Frutiger and having the possibility to do Arabic versions of his own typefaces or being able to actually work side by side with Professor Herman Zapf and, and uh, to do three projects together and to design together. And, and this is for me probably one of the best experiences I've ever had, being able to work with him. And you learn so much from a designer like that when you just sit next to them and you see how they see. Because often when we look at our legends and our designers and, and you see their finished product, you don't see them in the middle of the process and how they go about solving the problems. And that sometimes is more interesting than the finished product because the finished product is a finished product. But the process of how to approach design is something that you can take to many different projects. There is more to learn there than in the simple finished version of the design process. And, and so it was amazing being able to work with him. Um, this is, these are some of the typefaces that I designed uh, while uh, with a company. So this is the Frutiger Arabic. Uh, this is a hybrid between two styles in, um, in Arabic, a Kufi and a Nasr. I, I will mention why I'm talking so much about hybrids in a bit. Uh, this is the Noya Helvetica Arabic. Again, more Nasr than Kufi, but again, a hybrid between the two. Uh, Universe Next Arabic, more Kufi than Nasr, and again, is a hybrid. Uh, the Next Arabic, definitely more Kufi, uh, more mechanical. Uh, it, it's easier to get a match between an Arabic and Latin when you remove the pen influence and things go very mechanical because the biggest difference coming in Latin and Arabic is from the movement of the pen. In Arabic is much more organic. In Latin there is more of a repetitive rhythm and, and that creates a slightly different feel in the script. Um, one of, again, this is definitely way more Kufi. This is the ITC Handel Gothic. This is from, uh, this is one of my latest releases. Um, and then in the pure Nasr style, there's the Palatino Arabic that I designed with Professor Hamans Af. Uh, and then the Palatino Saint Arabic. I did more than this, but I'm not gonna show everything. So uh, <laughs> otherwise we just sit here forever. And uh, so this is some of the, the highlights of, of the typefaces. Basically my job was to look at my favorite of typefaces of our best sellers and then do an Arabic version of them, which, which is really cool. So um, it's, it's always fun to do that and, and uh, um, good to see the different flavors of the typefaces and to get a sense of understanding of how they work and how you can get a solution for, uh, for you to be able to work with that. And, and, and the design at the end of the day is, is in the details. Uh, it's, it's the little intersections, the little touches, but it's also very much in the structure and uh, how the typeface is built. Uh, the typefaces, letter forms, it's, it's, you have the skeletal system, the backbone, and then you have the meat on them, the muscles. And, but the structure is really what makes you a human versus uh, a monkey. And, and so whatever meat you put on that skeleton, if the skeleton is not a human, the end result is not a human. So it all boils down to that. And there are different ways of looking at type design, but I am from the school of thought that looks at structures, movements, pen movements, rhythms, rather than things and things. So the first basic ingredient is always the structure and how it moves. And, um, and I've been also been asked this, uh, why do you stay with monotype? Because people think that I am at a point where I can, again, have my own independent foundry and do it my way. And, <laughs> and why do, you, do I stay with them? And, uh, I've been with a company now between Linotype, which is now Monotype, 11 and a half years. It's been a long time and, and they are a family to me now because I've left my family in Lebanon. I also have family in the US and in Canada, but uh, these are the people that I've spent my career with and I've learned a lot from them and they are also the home of my typefaces. So uh, there is a sense of belonging in that sense that I want my babies to be in good hands, so I want to stay there. Uh, but it is also a place where I've learned a lot, whether it is in my five years that I spent doing marketing, <laughs> my uh, working with the colleagues across the different offices. Uh, I always tell people that I will stay as long as there is something for me to learn. And I keep changing jobs every few years. I think that's their strategy, so keep me. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been good. And the reason why I mention this 
is, and this is a bit awkward, and, and I hope I don't get heckled, okay? So respectfully, yes, that's what we agreed in the beginning. So we've, we've been, uh, the, things have been weird when it comes to the type industry and monotype in the last couple of years, and we've been getting a lot of uh, trash. <laughs> um, people have been sometimes correctly so, and sometimes not correctly so, very critical, uh, openly or behind closed doors. Uh, some of it is well-grounded, some of it is not. And, uh, and I think it's a bit unfair. Uh, like any family, we are not perfect. That is the case in any organization. And humans are not perfect in any sense. And every time you have a group of people with the more people, the more imperfect, basically. So the imperfections compound one another. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we are a small community, and we are here for one another, and monotype is not going anywhere, and we don't want the type designers to go anywhere. And I don't say this as a spokesperson for monotype. I did not run this by any marketing person. So I'm speaking here, speaking here as Nadine with an insider view. Um, and you can come up to me, and we can talk afterwards as well. But I think it makes more sense that we talk to one another rather than you know, hide on Twitter behind Twitter handles and just lash out vitriol. Um, the similar as in politics, there is a lot of vitriol going around. Uh, and there are two approaches to this. There will be people who will come up and actually talk to us and say, you know, this is not really good. Can we do something about this? And then we talk and we try to fix this. And there will be people who will just go on to Twitter and just complain or go somewhere else and complain. But I will always prefer a more constructive attitude where we come together and we talk. And it's totally OK to disagree. but. Um, I think there is better results in, in conversation rather than in grandstanding. And there is too much vitriol to go around in such a small community anyway. So um, it makes more sense that we you know, try to be a little bit more positive. At the end of the day, we live off one another. And uh, you know, the e-commerce channels that we have are there to support the type designers who are actually independent. So. Uh, the health of the one depends on the health of the other. And uh, I think it makes sense that we talk more about that. Um, but one of the, so in some cases, like I said, some of the criticism is, you know, valid, <laughs> like I said. Um, but um, sometimes it's not. And in those cases, it's usually a problem of lack of understanding of the business of type design. We live in a time where there has never been as many talented type designers around the world as it is today. I, I, I seriously doubt that there was ever this many talented people working in the type world. Seriously doubt it. But at the same time, we are not dedicating enough resources to discuss the business of type design, the business of font licensing, and what it means. People who start in this field do not have anything to read much to understand how to set up an independent foundry. What does it mean to license? What do we need to discuss if we're signing a contract with a foundry? What should I have in this contract? It's not there. And, and, and this, is, this is a shame, and it needs to, it needs to change. Um, so um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, if you will excuse again another, uh, so basically, we're going to talk about everything today, except sex, right? Sex and guns. These are the only things we're not talking about in this presentation, OK? So <laughs> yeah, we're doing like a full roundabout of everything that I'm talking about. This is like everything I've ever wanted to say. I apologize if this is annoying for anyone. Um, but uh, OK, uh, let's see. I'll, I'll find out on Twitter afterwards. <laughs> so, so something that we need to know about the type business is how to protect our fonts. Uh, I uh, did something terrible the other day. I read the license agreement of another foundry. I cheated. I shouldn't have done that, but I, I did. And it's a very respectable foundry with amazing work, and I love these guys. But in their license agreement, there is no mention of trademarks. So their license agreement with their designers, right? They don't mention the trademark at all, ever. Like, who owns the trademark? It's the only thing that you can protect, the only thing that there is no contention about is the name of the typeface. But there is no mention who owns it, who fights to keep it, who registers it, nothing. No legal protection, not at all. It's not, it's not even part of the conversation. And I think that's the problem. Another problem, there was also no mention of copyrights. So we cannot protect 
design as a copyright, at least not in the US. Sometimes in Europe, depends on the design of the typeface. But it says that the typeface is not protected as a typeface. We cannot protect the design. But you can protect some of the data. But then again, in the license agreement, there was no mention of who owns the data. There is that, you know, you need to say you are the owner of the design. Yes, but what happens after that designer gives the font data to the foundry? Who owns that data after it's been, you know, run through production and work and all of that? This needs to be discussed. Um, and we need to be aware that this is important for us to talk about. Um, another thing which is always funny, and, and this has been doing the rounds for quite a while, is royalties. How do we calculate royalties? So again, I hope you are patient with this. Uh, ah, before we get to that. So like I said, when I joined Linotype, uh, the person who hired me is Bruno Steiner. He's the previous managing director of Linotype. And he had this in his, if anyone has seen this, the Garden of Type presentation that he had given at a few conferences. I saw him in Barcelona a few weeks ago, and we were discussing. I was telling him about this talk. And then we talked about, about that. And then he mentioned this. And I was like, I'm going to quote you. So now I am. Uh, he says that type designers are often like the scribes. They love what they do, but they are very involved in what they are doing. They're not so much involved in the business aspect of typefaces. And at the end of the day, we pay the rent from our fonts. And there is no shame in wanting to look out for that. There is no shame in talking about it. So uh, we're going to talk about a bit of math now. So uh, we're not discussing the shape of the, the dollar sign. We're going to be discussing the actual dollars. So uh, what I have here is like four samples of how royalties are corrected. I've sit in. I've, my grammar is fucked. So I've sat, <laughs> I've sat in panel discussions, even at TypeCon, where someone was saying, I get 50%. And the other was like, yeah, my royalties are 20%. And then discussing 50% and 20%, but the proper equation is 50% of something. It's not 50%. We need to know how to calculate and to understand what every equation means. In the first line, say you have, you make, you sell, you license a typeface font, and you get $100. So 100% of that is $100 for you. This is usually the case if you are an independent foundry and you are taking care of your own sales, right? So, but that $100 needs to pay for your e-commerce site, uh, any overhead costs, legal costs, uh, credit card charges, and time to support the designers and, uh, sorry, the clients. And uh, as a side note, I, I asked a colleague of mine, uh, we were discussing what's the funniest things that have happened in support. We had a client who uh, had a trouble uh, installing a typeface. And he contacted our support, and they told him, like, OK, uninstall the font, and then restart and install again, and maybe it works. And then he was like, OK, I have deleted my entire fonts folder. What do I do now? <laughs> And, and of course, you know, the colleague was like, <laughs> so nice. Another one, uh, there was a client who was unhappy with one of our fonts that supported Cyrillic because his expectation was that if you type in English, the font should translate the text to Russian. <laughs> but our font was not able to do that. Therefore, he wants a refund. And, and so, yeah, so you have people like this, no? Uh, who will most likely vote for Trump anyways. But, <laughs> but, but, so, but you will have these people, and you will need to talk to them. So you need to decide as an independent foundry, do you want you know, to talk to these guys or not? Uh, or do you want to like, outsource that you know, headache? So, uh, but in any case, you keep all of the money that you make. Um, another version, if you, are, if you own your own independent foundry and you have a reselling uh, uh, contract. So for someone like with my fonts or any of the other e-commerce channels where you get usually around 50% of the sale. So if you have a hundred dollars license fee, uh, then you are getting $50 out of that. But then you will have, if you are a designer who is licensing, it gets more complicated, who is licensing with a foundry and that foundry has a reselling agreement with a sales channel like my fonts. The, the red bit in between parentheses, so the foundry will get 50% of the 100, they will get 50, and the designer gets 50% of that, and they will get $25. Or you have the, for example, like with mono Monotype, you have 25%, but then because we own the, the channels, then you get 25% of the 100, and you get $25. So 
Of course, you will think, ah, $100 is more than $25 is four times. I will only want the 100. But that's not how it works because we also have to think of the market reach. And we also have to think of direct versus indirect. And many people actually have something that mixes all of these models together. So they will have a reselling agreement with one foundry, with one sales channel. And then they will, have, they will also have their own direct sales where they do their own support and all of that. And we need to be able to understand the differences between direct versus indirect sales the difference between um, you know, all of these uh, different terms. And, and also the two very important terms, revenue versus end user price. End user price is what the client paid. Revenue is what the company made. And so like you can see in the example where we're going through a foundry, the foundry, the end user price was 100, but the revenue for the foundry who is going to pay you licenses is actually only 50. So you always need to keep that in mind. For me, it sounds very basic, but I've also sat with marketing people and sales people, so I sort of picked it up from them. But I think we should encourage people, especially designers who are starting in this, by those of us who have had experience in this, to, to, to actually sit down and understand how they can make a living. Because we all want to be able to make a living in type design. We don't want to have to do other jobs, right? And I think it falls upon us to educate the newer generations and to write and talk as much as possible about how our industry works so that we can help people protect their intellectual property, help them do their best decisions, decide on what is the best decision for them. This is not saying do this or that. This is just this is the math. And you need to decide what math works better for you. How do you want to spend your time designing or doing customer support or a mix between the two? There is not one correct answer. It depends on the individual. That's what we need to understand. And, uh, and that's how we need to, um, what we need to try to support uh, especially because we have so many new designers coming and every year there's more and more designers you know, graduating from the different programs and, and it's, uh, it falls upon us as a community to formalize a little bit to talk about these things. It's not just the serif and where it came from. It's the license and how you manage to get it as well. <laughs> so that's not a slogan, but I just made it up. But anyway, so, so we also need to understand the difference between a foundry and a distribution channel and what it, each one means and its uh, obligations to you as an independent designer. And again, we don't talk enough about these things, and, and we should, especially given the situation today of having so many foundries and so many funds and many people speak about like, how do I make my typeface visible? How do I stand out when there are thousands and thousands of fonts out there? How, what do I do? And, and this is, uh, th there is no one answer. Some people have managed to, you know, make a name for themselves and, and, and others not. And sometimes it's not the quality of the design. That's, that's the reality. It's not just how good you are as a type designer that decides how successful you are. It's, uh, it's a combination of many things. It's the design and it's the marketing. And so we should also talk about the marketing and how we can talk about typefaces and inspire people. Because often what happens is that, uh, and we'll get to that in a bit, when, when clients come to us, they want the most popular. They want the easy solutions. They're not willing to take risks. But we don't want those easy solutions, right? We want people to experiment because we want to experiment and we want to push boundaries and we want to be able to educate our users. And so we need to find ways of how to talk about type design beyond the simple, we've done a specimen or we've done a microsite and this is it. We, we, we need to find more ways of getting people to stop using the usual suspects. It's, it's in the best interest of all of us. Um, I'm not saying don't use Helvetica anymore. I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> definitely use Helvetica. Um, but you know, you understand. It's, we, it's, it, there's a whole world of typefaces available. And uh, sometimes the graphic designers are too conservative in their choices. And, and we need to be able to uh, inspire them to try out different things. And um, yeah, so that's a section a bit about the business. And then this is a bit which is what was advertised in the program. So all of this was the introduction. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm half dead by now. So uh, yeah, it's jet lag. It's not so easy coming to the West Coast. But, but there is this question of, of design space. Uh, some of you, ha how many of you have heard about the controversy versus questions versus what else of infillism by show of hands? Who is aware of the current conversation? Uh, not enough. OK, so there's. Emigre, one of the main designers at Emigre was saying that uh, we're not designing anymore because 
everything has been done and now people are just filling in the gaps and it's infillism. And then there was uh, several replies to that, one of them by uh, Chris Sowersby, and then he's saying like, no, this is an attack on our generation, no, we are creative. And you know, so there's been a lot of discussion about this and, and it is an interesting topic because are we, uh, we, we need to talk about this. Uh, are we just filling in the gaps? And, and it's a very, very important question. Because again, we come back, why are we designing? If, if the whole point of designing is to go to work and make a tweak of Helvetica, what's the point, right? Um, if, if, if all that we do is push around a few nodes, tweak a few things and pretend it's a new typeface, then again, what's, what's the point? Surely there is better things that we can do. Uh, there is a less of a waste of time. But if it is that we are trying something because there is something that we want to say that has not been said before, then that is a very different story. So it's not just the typeface, it's the approach to the typeface, it's the world it lives in. But in any case, we'll, we'll get to that. But, um, but the question is, are we really just filling in the gaps? Ah, actually, this is not a good time. So who feels that type design has become too restrictive, that everything is just a copy of one another? By show of hands, who thinks that? Okay. Who feels that there's a lot of creativity and innovation happening in type design today? Okay, more hopeful crowd. Okay, good. So, <laughs> very unscientific, but okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so there are those who are hopeful and those who are not. And, and in my mind, um, it's not the question is, are we just filling in the gaps? It's what are we, there are other questions we need to answer to be able to answer that question. Um, what is the design conversation of today? Design conversation, at least in my definition, is when you walk in the street, the billboards, the books you buy from a library, from, no, from a bookstore or things you see in a library, you go to a concert and there's a poster, you go to a restaurant and there's a menu, there is a collective design space that we are interacting with. And this becomes part of our collective memory, the same way that we know the show tunes of our favorite cast shows from the 80s or 90s or wherever we grew. This is collective consciousness. The work that we do, the design that makes it to the street is part of that design conversation because it engages with the public in something that is relevant to the way they are living. Typefaces that do not make it to that space are existing for other reasons, sometimes simply for the sake of existing, sometimes because it's a niche project, sometimes, I'm not saying we don't do that, but anyway, but there is this design conversation. So where are we in relation to that design conversation? Where are we in our understanding of what happens in other arts, or what happens in politics, or what happens in science, or what happens in the psychology of today? Are people afraid? Are people happy? What do they want to say? What about social media? This connected but not connected. All of these things. Uh, where, where do we fall in that? These new typefaces that we do, are they part of that conversation or not? This is something that is always interesting for me. It's always a question that I am asking. And what is it that we are contributing? Is it needed? Does anybody want this typeface that I'm drawing? If nobody wants it, then why am I drawing it? Is it just for fun? Is it just for it to exist? Is it, uh, why? <laughs> Sometimes it's okay, it doesn't have to have a reason. Nobody ever has to use it, it's totally fine, you decide. But we need to ask these questions. There is not one right answer, but we need to think of them. And then when we're thinking of these things, these new typefaces that we draw, are they adding a voice? Are we enabling someone to say something that way they were not able to say before? If that is the case, then even if it is similar to Helvetica, then maybe it's not a problem. Then it's, it's all about, at least to my mind, and you guys will have other answers, right? It's not just, this is just what I think. Um, it's, typefaces need to speak, and that's, my whole view on things, that words are meant to speak, typefaces allow that, and they are part of that conversation. That's, that's why typefaces need to exist. That's why we need to make them. It's, again, it's not Pokemon. It's the, the, there is a purpose. They are an ingredient, and they will only come to life when someone has decided that this suits what they want to say. So it is in that moment of choice that a typeface lives. And that, that for me, is the critical question. And so what, what makes a good typeface? And again, many people will have different views. Um, could be the craft, that is one. How well is it done? The creativity, is it pushing boundaries? Is it showing a design solution that nobody has said before? 
has done before. The functionality, is it working? The performance, is it working well? Does it fit what it's intended for? The personality, which is the voice that it tries to do. And I think on all of these, the bit, at least in my view, sometimes in certain aspects of type design, the creativity bit is the one which is a problem. And, and uh, in many spaces where we, if we think of a map of all the typefaces in Latin that exist, we have congregations of typefaces that look very similar. And those would be, you know, the workhorse sans serifs and the workhorse serifs, those typefaces that you can use everywhere. When you look at that space, it's practically incest. Right? At least that's how I see it. Very little new DNA is coming into that room. It's one small space, and we're getting more and more crowded, and people are on top of one another. And every time you move, uh, you hit another typeface. It, there's a play, a very famous play, Egyptian one. I will say it in Arabic. Don't freak out. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, because speaking Arabic in the US, this is, seems gets you off planes. So, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> so. So the play is a guy, is funny as a comedy anyway, he goes into a sauna and, and he doesn't have a glasses on and he goes and he's like feeling his way around. And it's a sauna and people are not wearing anything. And so he says, and it's like, which is, I feel and I apologize, I feel and I apologize. That's how he made his way around the sauna. And so in a way, the type scene in that small space of the workhorses, it is a little bit ahasiswat, right? And I never had to worry about this. I design in a space that is practically Mars. It's almost uninhibited. Uh, very few typefaces in Arabic exist. Whatever I draw is always different from anything else that ever happened before, so I'm just relaxed and I don't have to worry. But now I have a team that I need to supervise, and now it's my headache as well. And I need to make sure that the typefaces they design do not look like things that existed before because I don't want that we do that. And they need to have an element of originality. There needs to be something unique in them. And in that small space, it's very difficult to be unique. So we're going to come to that space later. But it is something to think about. What do we do in a room that is fully crowded? Do we get people out of it? Or do we try to push the walls to become wider? That, that is something to, uh, to think about. But having looked at what makes a typeface great and uh, good, <laughs> what makes a great typeface, in my mind, is that zeitgeist. Zeitgeist is a German word. It says the spirit of the age. If a typeface is capturing that, if it's able to speak to how we live today, then it has that zeitgeist that makes it very special. But then, how does it become one of the greats? It's, it's within this oxymoron. It's zeitgeist and timelessness at the same time. A typeface that can speak to its generation, but is at the same time timeless. And how does that happen? It's like Shakespeare. Some words that were written 500 years ago still ring true, even five centuries later. And there are typefaces that are able to speak to every generation because there is something in them that does that. And that's what makes it one of the greats. So, uh, the way I look at it, and, and I am governed by my very unique experience of having not had to design Latin typefaces ever, or only one time I graduated and I never do it again. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> so um, I've had to look at the relationship of Arabic and Latin like my entire career to date. And the key is to understand how the typefaces move. And it's in the movement and in the structure. So my view of Latin has always been, at least in recent years, is simply understanding how is that typeface moving and what structure is it built upon. And that gives more liberation. Because the moment we say, I want to design a geometric sans serif, 90% of your design decisions have been made. And you've drawn a room around yourself. And that's it, you're boxed in. If you're same with humanists, same with any of these categories that we have, the moment you decide that your starting point is an existing category of design, then you are sitting in a room that is getting more and more crowded as you go along. And so then, in my mind, that's not the right way to start. Um, you should look at movements or structures. And first, of course, is the function. What is the typeface supposed to do? And then you look for the kind of structure and movement that gives you that. And then you design. And then maybe you find yourself in a different space. So, for example, uh, when I am designing in Arabic these days, I'm designing hairlines. And even with the Latin, we, we're basically drawing hairlines even when the clients don't need them or don't want them. Because there's a clarity of structure that the hairline brings you that 
It takes away the decisions on how you modulate or how you treat the edge. It puts you in that very, basically, naked view of type design. And, and uh, there, is, uh, there is a liberation in that. And so we look first at the structure, and then we dress it up with the stroke. And we're looking at the movement. Is it fast? Is it solid? Is it uh, slow? Is it energetic? Uh, is it open? Is it structured? Is it organic? What kind of modulation do I want to put on that? And what kind of contrast? What kind of weight? What kind of treatment? These are coming after. But first, you strip the typeface into its structure. And then you try to build around it. And then it's a little bit liberating. It's not the only answer, obviously. There are many things we need to take into account when we're discussing type design and how to design. But this is, uh, this is at least my way of how I look at Arabic. And when it comes to Latin, like I said, I'm not designing Latin. I'm only supervising, and only since recently. It's only been since October, so I haven't had a lot of time to do that. But um, I, I am keenly aware that it's almost like this room that is crowded has a window, and I'm sitting outside, and I'm looking inside at the window. And, and so this is not the point of view of someone who is in that room, who has to draw within that confined space. This is just me looking from the outside. And um, so uh, what I try to do, because ever since I did a PhD, I, my answer to everything is first we research and then we talk. So I, I decided to look at the best of in 2014, 2015, everything that was almost everything from Typographica and then the TDC winners and also the best of on my fonts. And I thought that bringing those three elements together uh, gives maybe a slightly, hopefully, not comprehensive, I will never claim that, uh, an interesting view of what the industry thinks is interesting in terms of its output. And then to put them into categories based on movement, sort of. So this is, this is what, I, um, what I have done. In the first two categories, this is normal. This is the sans as we know it. These are typefaces that are the workhorses. This is what we expect this sans serif to look like. Uh, very interesting designs, uh, very interesting. So I'm not going to talk about any of them. And there's like 140 typefaces. I maybe know the names of five of them. So please don't ask me that one that was whatever. I, I will not know how to answer. So uh, anyway, so but these typefaces, um, like I said, they, they are the workhorses. And in case you're interested, because I didn't really highlight it, things that are in black and white are mostly from Typographica. Everything that has this kind of blue is my fonts. And then the colors that are not in these two usually are the TDC winners because there you don't need to color coordinate. So, um, so, so this is uh, this is sort of a view of uh, the workhorse on setups that have been highlighted in 2014, 2015, and you know you can draw your own conclusions of what is going on in that space. The interesting thing of uh, this entire exercise is the fact that there were very few overlaps in the typefaces from all these lists. There wasn't a lot of overlap between the winners, the Typographica, and, and the MyFonts ones. So uh, we, this is also something to think about. The serifs, again, is the workhorses of uh, serifs that are just, you know, the, at least what I think in my head, this is, by the way, my category, again, very unscientific. And it took one hour to do all of this. So it's not like, it's not a PhD, OK? So don't judge me if you don't agree. <laughs> so uh, please. <laughs> And, and so, so this, is, uh, this is, again, like I said, it's, uh, everything is there. This makes sense once you see what comes after. And uh, so this is some of the examples. And then there's the friendlies. The friendlies could be serifs or some serifs, but there is something cuddly about them. There is something in the movement, something in the curves that makes you want to hug the typeface. It's a little bit different. So if a client wants to come to you and like, our personality is very friendly, get me a typeface that reflects this friendliness, these would be some of the candidates for that. Like I said, it could be serif, it could be some serif, but there is some quality in it, some openness, some friendliness, uh, some more friendly than others, some friendly in different kinds. There's the friend that hugs you, there's the friend who smiles to you, so there's different versions of it, obviously. But there is, and as you can see, I mean, it's not one style, but, but there is something interesting about these designs, and there's been more and more of them in the last decade or so. Um, you don't find many friendly typefaces if you look 200 years ago. It just didn't seem to be that way. Um, and then there's the unexpected families. Unexpected families is where, like, uh, 
one, at least one member of the family is suddenly looking a little bit different. So uh, basically, for example, what you see uh, with the, uh, the Gilsa, uh, you know, you have the inline. And then with the other one, you have God knows how many styles. And with these ones, it's almost like you take the decision out of the graphic designer's hand. Like usually they need to bring many styles together and coordinate so that they have, you know, some different typefaces that work together nicely. Uh, this kind of typefaces have already taken that shortcut. Like, you know what, we'll just do it for you. So they have all of these different styles that work together. This is also something that has been happening a lot lately, not so much before. And uh, before they used to be separate typefaces. Now they all come as part of the same thing. And some of them are like really cool. So it, like for me, at least personally, it's always very exciting when I see these kinds of designs. Uh, you notice like the, uh, the uh, the graded one, Ugh, forgot the word. So this is where the jet lag kicks in. Uh, anyway, so this style is very trendy on my phones, but it's not on Typographica yet. So uh, this is what people are buying. And um, anyway, so uh, and like you see here, you have you know slabs, you have sunsets, you have scripty stuff, you have condensed things, all of them in one typeface family. It's quite interesting, and it's also versatile of the type designer to be able to design in all of these styles together. So so again, this is quite interesting as a sort of a trend of things that are happening. Uh, the corner is a typeface that winks at you. So normally we are drawing and you are moving, but then when you have that corner as part of your design element, it's almost like stop and look at me. That's and then wink. So <laughs> that's sort of what these typefaces are doing. And so there is some sort of abrupt change in movement, that something different is happening, and then you will have that corner. And uh, these typefaces are showing, especially that one over here, uh, quite a lot of you know, interest in, in, in that. So it's part of the design language, in these cases not as much. Um, the experimental, uh, this is my least favorite. And, and I, when I say I want more experimental designs, in my head, what I am thinking of is, typefaces that can be workhorses but have experimented and found a new solution so that we can have a workhorse without copying something else. Uh, in this case, the experimental is like, most of the times is like deconstructing the structure. And sometimes you end up with things that look a little bit strange. You need them because sometimes you need a typeface that looks strange. But in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. So it's a little bit of uh, here and there mixing of things. These kinds of typefaces, will be more difficult to use. Uh, but then we also need them, and they also exist. And there will always be experimental typefaces, and, and that's, that's also OK, and that's quite good. And we need that in any case. So um, yeah, so this is part of that. And, and, and uh, you see immediately the difference in flavor when it is experimental from my fonts versus experimental from something else. Um, and then there's this one also, which is like super, super, super experimental. And I don't even know how this thing would be typeset in a font. But anyway, um, it's interesting. So um, the wild is experimental pushed all the way to the edge. And then the letter forms are not looking almost like letter forms anymore. Uh, it's just an extreme version of the experimental, not the first one in color, not so much. The broken is, uh, is a bit difficult to find a word to fit this one. But basically, it's one where the movement does not continue. So the movement is broken, not the typeface. The typefaces are fine. So it's the movement in, especially it's, this, it's like you have like vertical strokes and that repeating rhythm. So it's not like you are writing, but you have like one, two, three. It's, it's very, uh, it's almost like you're driving and you keep hitting the pedal, the, the, the brakes. So, but again, it's, this is gorgeous, by the way. I'm not, it's not anything against it. It's uh, quite, quite nice. Um, the brush is, in my head, um, John Downer. <laughs> so this is what you expect John Downer to, to do. <laughs> and and uh, this, is, this is where things start to become very exciting in terms of design, like from this onwards. Uh, there's the brush movement, there's a lot of speed, there's a lot of freedom, there's a lot of power and energy. And it's really, really exciting, especially once you start to have all of these unexpected families that are based on brush. And, um, and this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, um, Really interesting what is going on here. And this stuff, sometimes it feels to me that we as type designers have our noses up, like, no, if it's not a serif or some serif, this is like script. Like, it's a little bit of a lesser kind of design. But this stuff is really hard to draw and, uh, and is, is unbelievably uh, gorgeous. And most of the 
things that I get excited about from new designs is usually in this kind of category. Um, and, and this stuff manages to catch the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, much more than, than what is there before. Um, in terms of uh, this one, this is a controlled movement. So we're thinking of calligraphy, but then there is a more controlled movement to it, so that the, you see the repetition. It's almost like you didn't write very quickly. And um, we compare it to the one that comes after. So you see that rhythm, no? It's, it's within that kind of controlled movement. Uh, some more controlled than others. But it's almost like the person who wrote, because this is full writing, uh, was taking their time and was doing things with a lot of attention. The uncontrolled is, is not. The uncontrolled is going more free in terms of where you put the stress, the kind of movement, and the speed within which the letter forms are drawn. And this is quite interesting because, again, it's giving a different flavor. And some are more uncontrolled than others. The lush is gorgeous curves, basically. You know, I, I don't know how to explain this phenomenon, but these curves are always very sexy. I, I, I don't know why. But um, maybe someone should, should study that. I don't know, but not me. Um, but, but there is, again, this, this sense of uh, refinement and, and this kind of quality that is very interesting. Um, and then the organic cupcakes. So, uh, so these ones are uh, basically, it's Instagram fonts. It's, it's like things that you can find on hipster, I don't know, restaurants and, you know, very, very 2016 kind of look. Um, when you go to a cafe and you get organic, you know, cupcakes that have been farmed from eggs that were in the backyard and, you know, the wheat comes from the farm in the street next door, you know, that kind of thing. But the typefaces are gorgeous. This is not to say anything about the typefaces, but um, it's that kind of, uh, there is a, I, I don't know, I don't know how to explain, but, but this is a phenomena of today, uh, this kind of visual, and, and it's there, and these typefaces are extremely, extremely popular on my phones. The, the reason I say this, I mean, they're all, all the time in the top 50, you'll get tons of these typefaces. The reason I say this is because there is something to learn. Someone is looking for this language, this voice that these typefaces have, someone is looking for them. And the question is, someone who is looking for that voice, when they want a serif design, how does a serif look in this kind of voice? Or how does a sans serif look in that kind of voice? I, it's open for interpretation. But, but there is something to learn from these. And, and so this is sort of the review of um, uh, what, what these uh, typefaces are looking like. And, and so the question is, is our design space crowded? It's yes and no. In some areas, yes, it's really, really crowded. And it's, you, know, you move and you're already another typeface. If you push it up two units, it's this typeface, push it down five units, it's this other typeface, and then you're thinking like, okay, so maybe four units? So yeah, in that case, yeah, we really are drawing, and like you're always afraid, like, oh my God, we don't wanna copy anything, like let's check, and um, it's, it's difficult. But at the same time, and, and looking at these typefaces, there's a, a ton of creative work that is happening, uh, unbelievable creativity, um, gorgeous design, uh, it's really amazing. And so the question is, can we bring that skill and that craft and that originality to the crowded space that we have? Is it possible to, uh, to understand what graphic designers are looking for? Uh, because sometimes it feels that what we think is right is not always what our customers think is right. And we need to understand what they are looking for. And, uh, we also need to see where we look for inspiration. And, and some people will look in specimens, some people will look at street signs, some people will look at uh, you know, shop signs, whatever it is. Uh, each one of us will find inspiration somewhere, but the idea is that this small space that we operate in needs to expand. And it will only expand when we push those walls to make more room for experimentation, and it's only through experimentation, by being bold, by trying out things, by doing hybrids, by being unexpected. It doesn't have to be a formula. Type design is not a formula. We don't have to go by 
if it's this style, it has to be like this. Try, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, we fail, and it's okay to fail. Uh, you do many typefaces, some of them will work and others not, but, but, but the idea is that we, we need to try, and, and we cannot you know, sit and complain or like, take it too personally or whatever it is. The, um, there is quite a lot of us, and the design space, if it gets too crowded, then there is not enough space for all of us, and that would be a shame. And so together, I think, all of us, we, we need to you know, put our hands together and push those walls. Like, I don't know if you've seen it, like in Japan, someone got stuck under a train and all of the passengers came and they pushed the train to get the guy out. This is what we need to do. We push the walls, each in our own way, until we get that space to be bigger. And, and the source of inspiration will be whatever you think it to be. And my answer is this one. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, as always, I spoke too much, and, and we have a reception, and we only have 20 minutes to. Uh, what do we do? Okay, a few questions. Okay, so um, we have two mics. You need to come up to the mic, and uh, we'll take turns. Uh, if you really want the drinks, we can just have one or two questions. I mean, it, it depends, it's up to you. I wanted a long Q&A, but we started late and I always speak too much. So, uh, sorry for that. So anyone wants to ask anything? Uh, or just say anything, or tell anything, or complain, or like vote Trump, or I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So, John, so Mike one will, please, whoever is. Yeah, they're supposed to, yes. yeah. I'm just curious to put together the parts of your talk and imagine using some of the typefaces, particularly in the last sections you were showing, for the political messages you were talking about in the beginning. Yeah. That would change the discourse. Yeah. That would be very effective. That would be totally, yeah, that would be, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we, we all need to see applications of what we can do and how we can do them, and yeah, that, that's another exercise. I, yeah, any, any other question? So we, we stay with Microsoft, uh, wait, Microsoft, <laughs> Mike one. <laughs> I see Simon here, so I stay with Microsoft. <laughs> well, they are neighbors here. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so I almost jumped up and clapped when you were saying, if you start from saying, I'm going to design a geometric sans serif, you've already put yourself in the yeah. crowded room. So I, I was really thrilled you said that, but then you introduced a whole bunch of categories. Yes, yes, yes. And so I yeah. thought, well, if someone says, I'm going to design an organic cupcake font, <laughs> We have the same problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have a tendency to categorize. Yes. It's a human tendency. Yeah. Do you think there is an approach we can take to pushing the walls that doesn't involve categorization? Yeah, it's a good question. So John always has good questions. Um, yeah, so it's in, in, the, uh, in this review, what I was trying to do is look at the kinds of movements, so controlled versus uncontrolled, to understand what is actually going on. But that is something that is like post uh, design stage, right? This is an understanding of what has already been done. So the approach, if we want to design, so for example, we had a project that I'm working on with a team and I never let them say the words geometric sans serif. Like, no, we're not saying that. And that's not what we are doing. And so we, we talk about the typeface in terms of like, okay, it needs to be serious. Or it needs to have a very solid construction. Therefore, we don't want the transitions uh, to be you know, rounded. We want a more angular transition. Uh, it needs to be like this. Therefore, we need it to be, you know, this. It needs to be wide because it needs to. So we start to make the design decisions based on what the typeface needs to be and the personality rather than is it a geometric sans serif or a humanist or a grotesque? So it's simply trying to find the right adjectives. And I don't know if it really works or not, this approach, but we, we need to, yeah, we need to try. And, and sometimes, uh, yeah, just forget what we know. Forget all of it. And because and Catherine actually asked me one time uh, if the piano playing affects my design. I was telling her, you know, that movement needs to be effortless and all of that. But there is something in piano which is similar to this. You need to learn the notes, and then you need to unlearn the notes. You need to forget to read the notes, and you just play, and your hands will know what to do. And I think we have uh, so many skilled type designers 
who have internalized type design. They understand what makes a letter form work and what doesn't. And so if they break those boundaries, that's the thing which is exciting because they will inherently know what makes a typeface work. But then if they start from a different starting point, then maybe the solution will be a little bit better. So if they unlearn what they know and then they sit and try to draw, but starting from a different source of inspiration, then maybe, I don't know. And I don't know the answer more than that. <laughs> Any, any other question? Yes, please. Um, I don't know if you would call this a trend or if it's just kind of what I'm into, but it seems like there are a lot of movements to try to uh, recreate like people's handwriting as typefaces yes. or to restore you know, some old metal type case that one guy found in his basement. And I'm wondering if you see those kinds of projects as creative steps forward or is that looking backwards and actually not creating anything new? Right. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of romanticizing type design. Um, if it's someone you loved and loved a lot or someone you respected and you can recreate their typeface, your connection to that handwriting is emotional. It, doesn't, it could be that the guy has a crappy handwriting, but you do it because you have a connection with that person. It's almost like keeping part of them alive, at least in the typographic sense. So in that, you have that emotional connection. And that is a valid source of approach anyway. But that handwriting, is it something that can fit a purpose? That function is simply to be, to replicate typographically, digitally, someone else's handwriting. The moment it does it, you're done. So it could be that it's a typeface that no one will ever, ever want to use. So, but that's the kind of exercise that doesn't have to relate to Zeitgeist. It, it exists because of that emotional attachment. Uh, same thing like if it's an old case of metal type and then you digitize it, again, it's like a bit of romanticism. And, and um, in some cases it works, in some cases not. I tend to not be romantic, typographically speaking. Uh, in some cases, yes, but not, 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 not work-wise. So it, we all bring our different points of views. And I think the best thing is that we don't have to have the same point of view, otherwise we all do the same thing. So we always need someone to do other kinds of work and, and someone who is interested in historical sources that have no space in today's world, but the fact that they've designed this typeface means that this typeface exists for the next generation because they might want to use it. So there will be those people, I'm not one of them, but they need to exist. And, and I think it's the plurality of all of us that is the solution. And, and us bringing something we want to say, there is not one way forward. It's just, uh, yeah, a bit more experimentation, at least my view, more experimentation, and then, uh, yeah, just supporting one another, I guess. Thank you. Any other question? The questions are good, so don't be shy. It's okay. Any, anything else? Going once, going twice? <laughs> okay, going three times, it's, it's, it's reception time. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you.